Almost universally, ancient texts and spiritual traditions suggest that everything in our world is connected in ways perhaps that we're only beginning to understand. This field of energy, this subtle field of energy, is in fact described by Western scientists as a net or a web that creates what they call the underlying fabric of all creation. This field of energy has been here from the very beginning. It is an intelligent field, an intelligence that responds deeply to human emotion. We must feel the feeling as if the prayer has already been answered. And in that feeling, we are speaking to the forces of creation, allowing the world to respond to us, allowing this field, the quantum hologram, the mind of God, to respond to us with what it is that we are feeling within our hearts. What would it mean if we discovered that each moment of our lives is part of a conversation, an ongoing dialogue with the universe around us? What if everything that happens in our lives, from the healing in our bodies to the peace of our world, to our marriages, our families, our romances, our divorces, all the things that we see as life in each moment of every day, what if they're a reflection of this intelligence, this field of energy that the ancients described in their language and now that Western science is beginning to describe in a language that we recognize. Well, a growing body of scientific evidence suggests this is precisely the way that our world works. That the world, in essence, is nothing more and nothing less than a reflection of what we have become from within, our thoughts, feelings, emotions, our beliefs, our prayers. Princeton University physicist John Wheeler suggests precisely this concept uh, in an interview recently what he said was that we live in what he calls a participatory universe that rather than thinking of the universe as something that's already created and that we're plopped down in the middle of it having these experiences what Dr. Wheeler is suggesting is that the universe is a result of what we are doing in our lives he says we're tiny patches of the universe looking at itself and creating itself along the way now this is a, a radical concept because it suggests that when we look into the world of the quantum atom for that most minute ultimate particle, we may never find it. Because every time we look, the act of looking is consciousness placing, creating, building something there for us to see. And when we look into the expanses, the vast expanses of our universe, searching for the very edge of what we call creation, we may never find it. Because the act of consciousness searching is the creative force that puts something in place. Well, growing body, scientific evidence, suggests this is precisely the way our world works. And what we'll find is we discover uh, through the, uh, the experiments that have been done recently in, in the 20th century is that the ancients may have been very, very close, in fact, to describing precisely the way our world works in the language of another time. Between 1993 and the year 2000, a series of experiments were conducted in uh, accredited scientific and academic institutions that are now supporting precisely the concepts that the ancients so clearly spelled out in the language of, of their time. Three of these representative experiments are absolutely shaking the foundation of everything we now believe about uh, physics and the way our world works and are in fact suggesting that we are connected through this field of energy. The idea that there may be an all-permeating essence that connects everything is really not so new. Even in the world of science, the late 1800s, there was a, this tremendous spiritual revolution that was sweeping the earth. And at that time, there was a, a great debate as to whether or not this field actually exists. And during that time, it was called the ether field. In 1887, a very famous experiment was conducted to demonstrate once and for all, does this field exist or does it not exist? And based on the results of that experiment, Western science, specifically Western physics, has believed that everything that happens in our world is discrete, non-related, isolated. Things that appear to be happening in the same instant in time are simply coincidence. The very famous um, uh, Michelson-Morley experiment, the equivalent of the experiment, is if, uh, if you were to go outside of the building where you are right now, 
and moisten your finger and place it in the air above your head. And in that moment, you felt no wind against your finger and from that concluded that no air exists around you. That's the equivalent of this Michelson-Morley experiment. They believe that if this field actually exists, it must be moving. And when they tested for movement, they found none, and from that concluded that the field doesn't exist. From 1887 until the early 1990s, all of Western science was based on the principle that what happens in one place has absolutely no effect on what happens somewhere else. And now we know that this is absolutely not true. So I'd like to share with you three experiments that are absolutely shaking the foundation of, of Western physics. The first was conducted by uh, uh, a Russian physicist, Bla Vladimir Popinin, uh, in the early 1990s. He came to the United States to, to finish this series of experiments. And what Popinin did was he wanted to investigate the relationship between human DNA and the stuff our world is made out of, little packets of energy that we call photons, little particles of light, if you want to think of them that way. So the experiment consisted of taking a tube, a glass tube, uh, drawing all the air out of this tube, creating what today we call a vacuum, implying that there's nothing left in this tube. However, we know that there's still something left, these, these little particles of light. So Popin then measured the particles to see how they were distributed. Did they fly all over the place inside the tube, or were they all accumulated at the bottom, or what happened with them? And the results of this part of the experiment were not surprising because the, the little particles of light, the photons, were completely random, and this is what they expected. The next part of the experiment is where this gets really, really interesting, because they placed some human DNA into this tube, and the human DNA, when they remeasured the photons, the human DNA had caused the photons to form an alignment. The DNA was having a direct effect on the stuff our world is made of. Now, this is precisely what ancient spiritual traditions have always said. That something within us has an effect in the world around us. And Popinin's experiment, for the first time in recent times, is actually verifying this under laboratory conditions. And the next piece of the experiment is even more interesting, because what they found was that when the DNA was removed from the tube, we would expect that they would all go back randomly distributed, just the way they were before. And this is not what happened. What happened was, even though the DNA was no longer in the tube, the photons remained aligned as if the DNA were still there. And the question is, why? What is it that causes this effect? There's nothing in Western physics that accounts for why those photons should remain in the position that they were in when the DNA that caused them to be become aligned is now removed from the tube. This experiment is called the phantom DNA experiment because, uh, because the effects last whether the DNA is there or not. And what it tells us is, number one, is that DNA is communicating, human DNA, is communicating with the stuff our world is made of, the packets of energy that, that underlie all of matter. It's communicating through a field that has previously been unrecognized. Uh, the scientists call it a new field. My sense is it's probably been there all along, and we simply didn't recognize it. So we'll call this a previously unrecognized form of energy. The second experiment is a fascinating experiment. It's a military experiment. And what they did, in essence, was they took some human DNA, uh, some scrapings from the tissue of inside the, uh, the mouth of, of a donor or volunteer, and they placed this DNA in a device that could measure its effects in one room of a building while the donor that the DNA came from is in another room in the same building. So living DNA from one person, the DNA is in one place, the volunteer is in another place. And what they did was they subjected the volunteer to what they called emotional stimulation that would elicit genuine responses of emotion, of joy or sadness or fear or anger or rage in one part of the building. And they were measuring the DNA to see if the DNA would affect to the donor's emotions. Now, why would it? In Western physics today, there's absolutely nothing that suggests that that DNA is still linked to the donor on the one hand. And on the other hand, as they conducted these experiments, what they found was just the opposite. What they found was that when the donor was having his emotional peaks and valleys in one room, the DNA was having its emotional peaks and valleys in another room at exactly the same time. And we hear about experiments like this. We think of an energy that's being transmitted from point A to point B. And if the energy comes from one place and has to get somewhere else, you would expect that there would be a, a, a lag time, a little bit of time 
between when the emotion is, is created and when the DNA is responding. That's not what happened. What happened in these experiments, and this is very, very key to where we're going as we begin talking about the power of prayer. What happened in these experiments is that the effects were simultaneous. They were instantaneous. The instant that the donor was having his emotion, the DNA was, was already affected as if there were no transition time between the two. Well, these experiments were first conducted uh, within rooms that were separated by distances of maybe 50 feet. Later experiments, however, were conducted where the DNA and the donor were separated by hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles. I had the opportunity to meet the designer of one of these experiments, Dr. Cleve Baxter, and he shared with me one of the experiments that he had designed where the donor was in Los Angeles, but the DNA was in Phoenix, Arizona, almost 400 miles apart. And the effects were precisely the same. Whether they're in the same building or separated by 400 miles, the effect is instantaneous. This opens the door to all kinds of possibilities as to how that DNA remained uh, linked to the donor. What it says to us, once again, is that we're communicating with DNA uh, through our emotions. And that whether the DNA is within our bodies or we're separated by distances of, of hundreds of miles, the effect is the same. We call this a non-local energy. It means it's everywhere all the time because, uh, because the energy doesn't have to travel from point A to point B. So the third experiment was conducted, again, in the early 1990s by the Institute of Heart Math, uh, a pioneering research organization uh, based in uh, Northern California uh, that are exploring uh, the human heart is much more than simply as a pump that moves blood through our bodies. And although the heart... Our hearts do do precisely that. It may be the least of what our hearts do. They're, they're discovering that our hearts are the strongest uh, uh, magnetic field uh, in our bodies. And the electromagnetic field that is produced by our hearts has an effect that extends well beyond our bodies. The Heart Math Institute had earlier discovered that around every human heart, there is a field of energy shaped like a tube. It's called a tube torus and extends between five and eight feet beyond the human heart. And the question is, in this already acknowledged field, could there be another form of energy that is being carried by this field beyond our body? So they designed an experiment uh, to, to test precisely this theory. This is no surprise, they took some human DNA and they isolated the DNA and asked individuals that were trained to feel what are called coherent human emotions, very clear emotions of love, uh, appreciation, compassion, or, or anger, rage, and hate, to have those feelings on demand. And as the people who were trained to have the feelings did so, they measured the way the DNA responded. And what they found was this. They found that in the presence of, of appreciation, love, compassion, forgiveness, the DNA became tremendously relaxed. And what we know from other experiments is that this relaxed state of DNA actually enhances our immune response. Uh, when you ask people what it is about the, the, the feelings of love and compassion that give us our high immune response, uh, this may begin to tell us why, because the DNA is, is relaxed and actually allows certain portions of those little switches, if you want to think of them that way, to be enabled or turned on. And just the opposite is true as well. In the presence of anger, rage, hate, and jealousy, DNA was tightened like, like a little knot, and it actually uh, shut down in some instances. Those little switches uh, depleted the immune response. Intuitively, we know this. We know that when people live in a state of jealousy or, or anger or rage, uh, that it depresses those portions of our, of our bodies, and just the opposite, love, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, uh, that, that those kinds of things are enhanced. And now, perhaps for the first time, these experiments are beginning to help us to understand why. It's the effect of human emotion on what is called the conformation or the shape of the DNA in our bodies. And what these experiments showed and what the lab results, uh, uh, the lab notes and the published papers actually described was that very specific kinds of human emotion have the power to change the shape of the DNA in our bodies. And this is an amazing thing to say because what it says is that on demand, when we choose to elicit very specific kinds of feelings and emotions inside of our bodies, we actually have the power 
to change the way the DNA functions in our bodies. This is the, the beginning of an internal technology, perhaps a very ancient technology that was described in languages of our past that we're only beginning to understand. Well, each of these three experiments was interesting unto itself. In some instances, the researchers were not aware of, of the experiments that the other, uh, the other laboratories were doing. And these experiments are only representative. Other experiments have been conducted uh, along the same lines, giving the same kinds of results. When you put them all together, however, rather than being interesting, isolated experiments, they begin to tell a story. And the story looks something like this. The first experiment, Vladimir Popanin's experiment said that the DNA in our bodies has a direct effect on our world, on the physical stuff our world is made of on the energetic level. The last experiment shows that human emotion has the ability to change the DNA that's having an effect on the world around us. And the middle experiment, the one that was conducted by the United States Army, shows that whether we're in the same building or 400 miles apart, the effect is the same. We're not bound by space and time. And as a matter of fact, the results of the experiments are saying precisely this, that you and I have a power within our bodies that is not bound by the laws of physics the way we understand them today. That something within us linked directly to the emotion of our bodies, thoughts, feelings, our prayers, our beliefs, transcends the limits of time and space the way we begin to understand them today. Ancient traditions describe this in the language of their time. Not only do they say that we are connected to the world around us, just the way Western science is now discovering, they invite us one step further, and they say, here's how you apply it in your life. They left us very, very clear instructions, saying this is the way you use this power, this inner technology within you to bring about change in your world, to bring about healing in your body, to bring about peace in your families and in your communities, and collectively, as many people come together, these principles work as peace between nations as well. And I'll share with you some of the, the studies that, uh, that were done uh, uh, that describe precisely how this begins to work. One of the questions that I'm often asked with regard to this material is if these relationships exist, if they truly exist, why don't we know about them today? Why doesn't Western science understand these principles? Why are we just now discovering them? Well, the answer to that question uh, begins in our understanding that the way we view our world today, our knowledge is part of a lineage of wisdom that links us with our past. And we know that that link, the link that ties us with those who have come before us, has been broken at least two times in recorded history. Twice in recorded history, something happened, an event occurred, and we lost information. And in some instances, it's information pertaining precisely to what we're doing right now. The first one of those breaks was with the, the burning of the Great Library of Alexandria in the fourth century. While we don't know precisely what was in that library, what we do know is that Roman historians had cataloged volumes and volumes of information, scrolls is the way the material was written at that time, uh, the Roman historian Kalamachos, for example, cataloged over 536,000 scrolls in the Great Library of Alexandria before it was burned, and many of them were very ancient in that time, in the 4th century. And we know that the scrolls contain some of the most ancient uh, documents of, of the Hebraic, uh, ancient Hebrew traditions, of the Egyptian astronomical traditions and medical traditions, much of the wisdom that had been passed down from thousands of years earlier. Uh, describing our relationship to our world, to one another, and perhaps to something even greater. When that library burned, we know we lost tremendous amounts of information then. And the second time was with the edits of the Western biblical texts, the biblical traditions in the 4th century uh, as well, in the year 325 AD. It was during this time in the early Christian traditions when the Emperor Constantine pulled together a council uh, and at that time, there was no biblical text, nice, neat, compiled text the way we see it today. It was a loose assemblage. Uh, many of the, of the texts were redundant. Some of them were poorly written. Uh, and very few people were able to access this material. And Constantine, in an effort to make it more accessible to a broad general audience, pulled together a council within the church and said, Council, make me some recommendations. What should we leave in? What should we take out? How should we arrange this material? 
And, and the result of that was what we call today our Western biblical text, biblical tradition. We know that at least 20 books were completely removed, and another 20 to 25 were uh, tremendously edited, and the remaining texts were condensed and rearranged into what we see today uh, as, as, our, uh, as our biblical text. So as good as our Bible is today, the best biblical scholars will openly and freely uh, admit that it is incomplete. And we know this because we're finding these documents in places like the Dead Sea Scrolls Library. This is why they were so controversial. When we found the Dead Sea Scrolls for the first time. We were able to see many of these books in their original form. Some of them hadn't been seen for 1,700 years. And interestingly, many of the books that were edited or taken out completely are precisely the documents that describe our relationship to the universe and the creation around us through the power of human emotion. So now that science is beginning to tell us in its language, ancient spiritual traditions have shown us in their way and in our own texts and documents, we're seeing references uh, to precisely how these principles work. The question is, how do we apply them in our lives? How do we go about making use of this relationship between thoughts, feelings, and emotions inside of our bodies and what's happening in the world around us? Well, perhaps the, the best place to begin is by defining uh, what a thought and a feeling and emotion really are. Um, I've had this conversation with my mom many, many times. And mom always says to me, she goes, I always thought feelings and emotions were the same thing. And while they're closely related, there is, uh, there is a difference. So if we think of a, of a chart, if you look at the ancient charts of the energy centers in our bodies, the chakra centers, if you will, what we see is the lower three energy centers of our bodies, they are closely associated with what we call the power of human emotion. And the ancients said we're capable of only two primary emotions. They said we're capable of the emotion of love and whatever we believe the opposite of love really is. Whether we think of that as fear or hate, uh, and when you get really deep into the traditions, what we find is, is they're actually both polarities of the same force. So in those lower centers, the power of emotion, uh, we have two primary experiences, love and whatever we believe the opposite of love really is. This is a, a power. It's a force that drives us forward in life, and it tears down the walls, uh, knocks down the barriers that stand between us and the things that we hold dear in our lives. Emotion, however, is scattered. It has to be focused. You can think of it as a power. If you know people live strictly in their emotions, uh, you know that sometimes their lives can be a little chaotic. Well, the emotions need to be focused, and this is where the power of thought or logic come in, and it's associated with the upper energy centers of the body. Thought is what gives focus or direction to the emotions. In other words, we have a thought about something. Uh, we have a thought about uh, a cloudy day outside. And that thought, into that thought, we pump, we fuel the power of the, the emotion, either our love of that rainy day or our fear of what that rainy day may bring to us. And by doing so, when we marry the power of emotion with the direction of the thought, by virtue of that, we create a feeling. So feeling, by definition, is the union of emotion and the thought. And the one energy center, interestingly enough, that is not accounted for in all the other systems uh, that remains unused in these ancient systems uh, is the heart center and this is the one that is dedicated to the power of feeling. We feel in our hearts. So the feeling that we have in our hearts is the language that speaks to the field that Western science is now beginning to, to understand through, through their experiments. It's the power of human feeling that is the language that opens the door to the possibilities of what we create in our world. Well, scientists today, as they think about this field, uh, it is so new, the idea is so new, that they've yet to agree even on a single term. Some scientists call this the quantum hologram. Uh, some call it nature's mind. Dr. Ed Mitchell, former Apollo astronaut, calls this nature's mind. Uh, scientists like Stephen Hawking call it the mind of God. As varied as the names appear to be, they're all speaking about essentially the same field, and they describe this field as a web or a net that underlies the fabric that links everything together. And it is this fabric, this web, this net, 
is what we speak to with the feelings in our bodies, with the feelings in our hearts. Ancient traditions not only recognized this relationship, they invite us one step further, and they left precise instructions in terms of how we apply this in our lives. In the late 1980s, I was an engineer working in the defense and aerospace corporations. I began exploring these concepts as an engineer, looking in the world around me to understand the history of those who have come before us. And it is that thinking that led me into the journeys of some of the most amazing places in the world, from the temples in Egypt, to the Andes Mountains in Bolivia and Peru, uh, into India and Nepal, the highlands of central China and Tibet, all through the American desert southwest. Searching for information and clues that would help us to understand how we relate to the world and how we can use this, this power of feeling, this power uh, that speaks the language, the world around us. So as an engineer, when I began studying the principles of those who have come before us, the information that they left so that we could understand our relationship to the world around us and, and this ancient technology that today we call prayer, my thinking was that this kind of information would be best preserved in places that have been least disturbed by Western civilization. Uh, and this thinking led me into a journey, uh, first time, in 1998 into the highlands of central China into Tibet where we had the opportunity to explore 12 monasteries and two nunneries speaking through the translators to those who actually live these principles in their lives and this is the value of going to a place like Tibet a living culture uh, we can go into temples in Egypt or temples the Mayan temples in the Yucatan and as fascinating as they are and as much information as they hold the cultures that left that kind of information no longer exist. So at very best, we are speculating in terms of what they're saying to us. When we go into a monastery in Tibet, we can actually speak with the people who are there. and We can ask them, when we see your prayers on the outside, what are you doing on the inside? What happens? What happens to your body? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you emoting? Well, it was in Tibet where I had the opportunity to meet with an abbot of one of the monasteries, and I asked him through the translator. Same thing we'd ask all of the monks and all of the nuns, and it was his answer that was so clear to me. And I, I asked him, when we see your prayers for 12 and 14 and 16 hours a day, when we see the mudras and the mantras and the bells and the bowls and the gongs and the chimes and the chants that you're doing in your prayers for so long on the outside, I said, what are you doing on the inside? What happens on the inside? And the abbot looked at me, and I like to think he was laughing with me, or he may have been laughing at me, because he said through the translator again, he said, you've never seen our prayers, because a prayer cannot be seen. He said, what you have seen are the things that we do to create the feeling in our bodies. And the feeling is the prayer. Then he turned the question on me, and he said, how do you do it in your culture? How do you do this in your culture? And I began to think about the way we think about prayer in our culture today. When we lost the texts that describe how the power of emotion and feeling are actually the language that connect us with the universe and the, and the creation around us, we began to believe that words are simply the prayers. If we say the right words, the right number of times, the right day of the year, the right time of day that we've said the prayer, and as well-intentioned as those prayers may be, what we know is that there is a modality of prayer that carries us far beyond uh, where simply offering the words will carry us. Western prayer researchers today identify four modalities of prayer. They say when we pray in the West, we use one or some combination of these four modes of prayer. Uh, the first is an informal prayer that's called a colloquial prayer. Uh, I had a friend of mine that lived in, uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco that would say this informal prayer coming home from work uh, every Friday on, on, the, uh, on the interstate. Dear God, if you let me get to the Conoco station before my tank runs out of gas, I'll never let my tank get this low again. Uh, and that is an informal prayer to God. Uh, the second mode of prayer is what is called a petitionary prayer, where we petition the powers to be. We petition the angel or angels, or, or we petition God. Amen. Dear God, I, uh, I claim the right 
to heal and be healed now in all past, present, future manifestations. That would be a petitionary kind of prayer. The third mode of prayer is a ritualistic prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. God is great. God is good. And the fourth mode of prayer is a prayer that has no words. It's simply a, a meditative prayer where we become aware of, uh, of a presence around us and in the silence. Uh, and there's some uh, dispute as to whether or not this is even a mode of prayer or not. But this is the way Western prayer researchers typically think of prayer in our world today. And as good as those modes are, and as, as well as they describe the way we pray, there's always been another mode, a fifth mode, that is not described in these uh, modalities. And this is precisely what the abbot in Tibet was describing to us. He was describing a mode of prayer that's based in feeling. And he said, we must feel the feeling as if the prayer has already been answered. And in that feeling, we are speaking to the forces of creation, allowing the world to respond to us, allowing this field, the quantum hologram, the mind of God, to respond to us with what it is that we are feeling within our hearts. So, rather than praying and feeling powerless in a given situation, dear God, please let there be peace in the world. This mode of prayer invites us to feel as if we are participating in that peace, just as John Wheeler suggested, that we are part of all that we see. And as we feel the peace in our world or the healing in the bodies of our loved ones, we are actually empowering the field to mirror that back to us uh, in a way that will bring those changes about in our lives and in our world. Well, this is precisely what the abbot was saying to us in the monastery in Tibet. In the early 1990s, I had the opportunity to see this mode of prayer, this feeling-based prayer, uh, enacted in, in a real-time situation. And I'd like to share the story because it, it perhaps best describes what otherwise is, uh, is a nebulous concept uh, regarding precisely how feeling-based prayer works in our lives. During the 1990s, early 1990s, the desert southwest was experiencing one of the worst droughts in history. And a Native American friend of mine invited me to join him one day in a place in the high deserts of northern New Mexico to share in a prayer of rain. He didn't have to ask me twice. I said, you bet, I'd love, I'd love to participate and see what this prayer is all about. So we met at a, uh, an agreed upon location and we hiked uh, through several uh, hundred thousand acres of beautiful high mountain desert sage until we came to a place that was so old uh, even the people today don't know who built this place. It was essentially a stone circle. And each stone was placed just as it was by the hands of the ancestors so long ago. And it was in this place that my friend began uh, his prayer. What he did was he removed his shoes, stepped into the circle in his bare feet. He honored all of his ancestors. He simply said, all of my ancestors, all of my ancestors. Honored the four directions. He turned his back to me held his hand in a prayer position in just a few seconds. And then he turned around and looked at me and he said, I'm hungry, let's go get a bite to eat. And I said, I thought you were going to share this prayer. I thought you were gonna pray for rain. And he looked at me and he said, no. He said, because if we prayed for rain, rain could never happen. Because the moment you pray for something to occur, You've just acknowledged that it does not exist in that moment. And I thought about what he said. It made a lot of sense to me. If I say, dear God, please let there be peace in the world, what I'm saying in that moment is that peace isn't there. And I may inadvertently be empowering the very condition that I would like to change. And the same with a healing in my body or the body of my loved ones. So I asked my friend, I said, if you didn't pray for rain just then, what, what did you just do? What happened when you closed your eyes? And you turn your back to me just for those few moments. And what he said was this. He said, when I closed my eyes, I began to feel the feeling of what it feels like to have rain in our Pueblo village. He said, I smelled the smells of what it smells like when the rain falls off the earthen walls of our buildings. And I felt the feeling of what it feels like with my naked feet in the mud. There's so much mud because there's been so much rain. And he said, in that way, I opened the door to the possibility to bring rain into our world. Well, I think about this mode of prayer a lot. 
Later that afternoon, something amazing happened. I was watching the weather maps, and the drought that had happened for so long suddenly changed. We saw the high pressure system move across Utah and then dip down from Colorado into northern New Mexico and make a little U turn and come right back up. We had rain that night. And we had rain all the next day. It rained and rained, and I called my friend. And I asked him, I said, There's so much rain, the valleys are flooding, the roads are flooding. What in the world is going on? And he was quiet just for a moment, and he said, That's the part of the prayer. He said, I never quite figured it out. So I have no way of scientifically validating that my friend's prayer had anything to do with that rain. But the correlations are so high. We see it happen so many times, we know there is an effect. 1972, 24 United States cities were used to conduct an experiment where people were trained to feel the feeling of peace in a very specific manner, and they were strategically, strategically placed in these cities. Each city had populations over 10,000 people. Uh, and these were documented in some of the very well-known uh, uh, TM studies that were done uh, back in the, uh, in the early 70s. And what happened was, during the time that the people were feeling the feelings of peace in the community around them, beyond the buildings where they were having their experience, the communities experienced statistically measurable reductions in crime, violent crimes against people, traffic accidents declined. Uh, in some cities like Chicago, where the stock exchanges, the stock market soared while peace was in place. And when they stopped their prayers, all those statistics reversed. And they did this time and time again to such a degree that the effect could be measured and it was applied in an even greater experiment that was uh, documented in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, 1988. And this was the experiment. It was called the International Peace Project in the Middle East. And what happened during the Israeli-Lebanese War in the early 1980s, as a result of these earlier studies, people who were trained to feel the feelings of peace were positioned throughout the war-torn areas in Israel and Lebanon. And during the time, what the researchers called the window, the prayer window, when they were feeling, people were trained to feel the feelings of peace in their hearts, when they were feeling those feelings, terrorist activities dropped to zero. Crimes against people declined. Emergency hospital room visits declined. And they tried doing these experiments different times of day, uh, different days of the week to make sure it wasn't an effect of, of weeks or weekends or holidays or or different times of the month to make sure it wasn't an effect of lunar cycles affecting people. And when the studies were complete, what they found, although we may not know precisely why this effect happens the way it happens, we know the correlations are so high that when a certain number of people begin to feel the feeling of peace or healing in their bodies in one place, the effect carries into the community beyond the place where these people are. And it is so precise that we now know, the statisticians were able to determine precisely the number of people that are required to kickstart, to jumpstart this kind of an effect. So I'll share the, uh, the formula, and then I'll describe what that formula means. The effect is first noticed when a certain number of people are participating. And that number, the minimum number, is the square root of 1% of a given population. So what does that mean? If you have a city of one million people, for example, you take 1% of one million on your little calculator, and then you take the square root of whatever that 1% was, and that number tells you how many people are necessary, the threshold number to begin the effect. Obviously, the more people that participate, uh, the greater the effect. Uh, for a city of one million people, that number is only about 100. In a world of six billion people, the square root of 1% of the given population is only about 8,000 people. 8,000 people, according to these studies, are the number of people, that's all that's required, to feel the feelings of peace in their hearts in a given moment in time, simultaneously, to kickstart, to jumpstart that consciousness linked through the field, as we know the field exists today, before that peace is felt in the world around us. So any discussion regarding this feeling-based prayer, this lost mode of prayer, uh, sometimes seems 
little more than academic, uh, until we can actually apply it in our lives or see it applied in our lives. It's in the late 1990s that I had the opportunity to do precisely that when I saw the footage documenting uh, the healing of a life-threatening condition within the body of a living woman using precisely the kinds of techniques that we're speaking about right now. For me, it was this kind of information that took this lost modality of prayer out of the realm of of academics and into something that's very real that we can apply in our lives. I had the opportunity during that time to see some video footage of the healing of a three inch diameter bladder cancer inside the body of a woman who by medical, Western medical standards had been diagnosed inoperable. She had gone as a last resort to a medicineless hospital in Beijing, China. It was in this medicineless hospital where they began simply by addressing uh, the life-affirming ways that she could change how she was living her life. They taught her life-affirming ways to breathe and life-affirming ways to nourish her body, gentle movements to stimulate the energy centers in her body. And as she was doing these and strengthening her body, at one point it made sense to undergo a process. Now, I'd like to, to share this. I'd like to describe it to you uh, as a very potent example of how the feeling world inside of our bodies has a direct effect, uh, in this case a very graphic effect, on the world beyond our bodies. So in the video documentation, the film shows a woman lying on a, uh, in, in a hospital room. She's fully awake, she's fully conscious, she believes in the process that's about to happen. Before her, there is an ultrasound technician who is running an ultrasound wand over her lower abdomen that we can see on a split screen television. And on the left-hand side of the screen, they do a snapshot, a freeze frame of an instant in time for reference so we can see what her condition looked like in that instant in time. On the right-hand side of the screen, we are able to watch real time as three practitioners stand behind her, working with the energy in her body and with the feelings in their bodies. And what they do is they begin to chant a word that to them they've agreed upon that in reinforces the feeling within them that she's already healed. The chant essentially says, already healed, already done. And as they begin to, to have this feeling and to say these words among themselves, on the computer screen, on the television screen, we can watch in real time this cancerous tumor as it disappears in less than three minutes real time. It's not like time lapse on a documentary where you see a rose unfold uh, in 30 seconds and something that normally takes days. This literally happens in less than three minutes. Her body responded to the feelings of the practitioners who were trained to have the kinds of feelings that they were having. And all they were feeling was the feeling of what it feels like to be in the presence of a woman who is already healed fully enabled, fully capacitated. They were not seeing her as a woman who was sick, and they weren't saying, bad cancer, you've got to go away. It's a very, very different way of thinking about things, and it's a very graphic example of precisely how, uh, how this principle works. I had the opportunity to speak to the gentleman, Luke Chen, that actually created this film, and I asked him a question. I said, what if those three practitioners weren't there? So could this woman have done this? Could any of us do this on our own? And he smiled at me when I asked him the question. He said, he said, Greg, in all probability, she probably could have done it alone. However, there's something about us humans in that we seem to feel more empowered and stronger when we're supported by others in the things that we believe in and in the things that we choose to accomplish. So while she probably could have had this feeling and done it herself, Having these three practitioners work with her uh, was the threshold that it took for her body to respond. All they were doing was having the feeling as if she were already healed, and in less than three minutes, her body responded. What Western physics now is beginning to tell us is that the same energy, the same field that led to the healing in this woman's body also leads to peace between nations. It's the same thing, different scale, same principle. And I've been involved in experiments where hundreds of thousands of people joined together through the World Wide Web. We were coordinated on the Internet at a given hour of time, a window of time, when we were trained to feel the feelings of peace in our bodies during that time. 
And when we did that, statistically, what happened in events around the world, there were wartime events. There were uh, 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 bombings, air, aerial bombings in Iraq that were scheduled, that were reversed during the window of time when this prayer was happening. Crimes against people declined. Emergency hospital room visits declined. There are, was a computer research project at Princeton University that was able to document the field of consciousness on a global level while these prayers were going on, and they saw a, a little glitch, a, a glyph on the screen indicating that consciousness was responding to hundreds of thousands of people feeling the feeling of peace in the moment that it was occurring. And what this tells us is that the field we're working with is a measurable field. You can pick it up with equipment. It could be measured uh, on the computer screen. This was part of the, uh, uh, the, the research project at Princeton University that was called the Global Consciousness Project. So the field is real. It's out there. And it responds to us in ways now that we're only beginning to understand. Even more recently, the research has been done by the scientist Masaru Emoto regarding the relationship between human emotion, human feeling, and water drops is showing this relationship even more poignantly. What has happened is that these scientists, this particular research project, has discovered that droplets of water that make up over 70% of our world anyway and 70% of our bodies, that these droplets of water respond to human emotion, whether it is felt in the body or as it is actually written on labels that are placed on the vials of water and the emotion of the researcher as the labels are being written and placed onto those vials. The vials are then frozen for a, a specific period of time, removed from the freezing process, and as they begin to thaw, they crystallize. And the crystals are the telltale sign of what is happening with the emotion. For example, they've taken water, highly polluted, highly toxic water, from some of the most uh, 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 polluted dams in the center of Japan. This water has never been known to crystallize. They just can't get it to crystallize. And when you look at it under a microscope, what you see, it's a very muddy, very nebulous form. There are no symmetry. There's no uh, uh, crystalline structure whatsoever before the emotions are in place. After the emotions are there, for example, when 500 people pray over some of this most polluted water, the before image shows the water in its toxic state. The after image of the same water shows this water beautifully formed, beautifully clear, beautifully crystalline, perfectly symmetrical, purely from the result of human emotion interacting and human feeling interacting with this field of water. Some of the other research has shown families where children and their parents have encircled a vial of water in a room that has never been found to crystallize, again, some of the very highly polluted and toxic water. And what they do, they make a game out of it. The children, they send love to the water. They say, we love you, water. We appreciate you, water. Thank you, water, for what you bring to our world and our lives. And in that innocence, they are eliciting these genuine states of emotion. And as the research continues, it is precisely these vials of water that have received this kind of energy from, uh, from the children and their families feelings that the ancients called prayer, that the water begins to crystallize into beautiful, uh, symmetrical, very clear forms, showing once again that there's a direct effect between, uh, between what we feel in our bodies and what's happening in the world beyond our bodies. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, very poignant example of how each of us has an opportunity to participate, not to control and manipulate, but rather participate in the events of our world the events of our lives, our families, our communities, and our bodies through the field that links all in creation. One of the powerful principles, most powerful principles regarding the way this field works is the fact that the field appears to be holographic in nature. The definition of a hologram is that it's a pattern. No matter how finely divided the pattern is, the whole remains, even in the smallest portion. For example, a few years ago, there were bookmarks, uh, shiny little foil strips, uh, and when they were shown in direct light, 
that had an image of uh, a rose fully in bloom, or the image of Mother Mary, or uh, the image of a dolphin jumping over a pyramid. And in these bookmarks, if they were truly holograms, you could take and cut them into the smallest, smallest pieces, and then take the smallest one of those and cut it again, and look at it under magnification, and the entire pattern would still remain even in the smallest, smallest piece. And I share this principle now, because it appears that consciousness, our consciousness through this field, works precisely this way. What it means is that all of us, as smaller portions of a greater pattern, are connected. And the seemingly little things that we do in our lives, day in and day out, the way we respond to one another at the family dinner table during our conversations, the way that we feel about the 6 o'clock news, the way that we respond to a driver that cuts us off on the freeway just before we get to our exit, in those seemingly insignificant moments of life, we are actually having a conversation with this field, the quantum hologram, the mind of God, individually. And when we put all of our little conversations together, that becomes the collective answer. The field mirrors back our collective love, our collective appreciation and gratitude, or our collective anger and rage and fear. So as we watch the events in our lives and our world unfold, and we ask ourselves, why are these things happening? And how can these things happen the way we see them? We might want to keep these principles in mind and ask yourself, do you believe, do you see these principles that I've just described? Do you see them playing out in the world around you? And if so, if the principle works in one direction, it works in the other direction. As we begin to feel the feelings of the things that we choose to experience in our lives and our world, by definition, the hologram must mirror those things back to us. I hear from so many people that when we offer our prayers from within our bodies that they need to be sent to the place that we choose for them to be. If we want prayers in the Middle East that we have to send that energy there. Or if we want prayers of healing for our loved ones that we somehow have to transmit from our bodies to where our loved ones actually are. And while I know that these principles are well intentioned, what the hologram says to us is that we don't have to send anything anywhere. It says that when we feel a feeling in our bodies, it already exists everywhere because we are part of that whole. Just like the pattern is complete, no matter how small we cut that bookmark, we are little pieces of this greater hologram, of this greater consciousness. And by virtue of simply feeling and using the energy to create what we choose within our bodies, it already exists everywhere all the time. Maybe you've had this experience. Have you ever gone to pick up the phone to call someone that you have an affinity for and found that they were already on the other end of the line? My mom and I have this experience. Uh, I try to call her at least uh, once a week from wherever I, are, I am. It's not unusual for me to pick up the phone and find that she's either already there or her line's busy because she's calling me in that very moment. So when that happens, what is, what is it that's occurring? How does the information get from where I am to where she is so that we're having that simultaneous connection? And I know uh, almost everyone has had this experience before. And the quantum hologram, perhaps, the holographic principle, this is the answer to this question. It's because when we feel something in one place, to some degree that feeling is already existing in every other place. And to the degree that we can focus that feeling within our bodies and hone our ability to feel those feelings clearly in our hearts rather than simply think them in our minds to that degree we have the opportunity for the kinds of healings that we see in the medicineless hospital uh, and for the effects that we feel inside of our bodies to be carried beyond our bodies into the world around us. So what does this information say to us today, really, about the way we live our lives and what we see happening in our world? Well, at the very least, what it says is that there's something out there. There's a field, a living intelligence that links, it connects everything in creation, excluding nothing. Whatever we see happening in our world, whatever we have happening in our bodies, we know by virtue of this principle that it's part of everything else. We know that we are linked to the field through what we call thought, feeling, and emotion. And specifically, the feelings in our hearts are the language that speak to the field. It's the language that the field recognizes. The field may not recognize the mental processes of language when we say, dear God, 
please let there be peace in our world. However, the field definitely recognizes the language of the feeling when we feel the feeling in our hearts as if that peace is already there. These are the principles, some of the most subtle and the most empowering principles that were left to us by the ancients in the language of their time. Today, 400 years after the birth of Western science, we are only now beginning to understand precisely the same principles. So while we may not fully understand everything there is to know about this field, where it comes from, or why it's there, we do know enough to apply in our lives the principles that we've seen work under laboratory conditions that the ancients left for us as well. From my perspective, this is a very empowering, very empowering body of information because it takes the idea of prayer beyond any religious or spiritual tradition and makes it an inner technology that's open to everyone, regardless of our beliefs, or our lifestyles, or our bloodlines, or our heritage, or how or where we choose to live our lives. What it says to us, in every moment of life, we're having a feeling. And by virtue of that feeling, we're communicating to the world around us. So rather than seeing a prayer as something that we do every once in a while, when we'd like to change our world, and then we stop the prayer and get up and walk away, perhaps we can redefine prayer as the way that we feel in our lives. And because we're always feeling in every moment in life, life becomes the prayer. Life becomes the living prayer. We can always have the feelings of peace in our hearts, whether we're driving down the freeway or studying in our classroom or going to the mall or the airport. To some degree, we can feel that feeling of peace. Life becomes the prayer. And as we look at the world around us and we see a world that so many people is changing so very, very fast, some people feel the world is absolutely out of control, feel powerless to do anything about it. These subtle principles remind us that we're part of all that we see. The world around us is nothing more and nothing less than a reflection of what we have become from within. And in the language of those who have come before us, we're reminded that we must become the very things that we choose to experience in life. We must become the peace and the healing, the cooperation, the compassion, the love, the nurturing that we choose to experience in our lives. We must become those very things so that the field has something to mirror back to us. And in that way, we each are given the guidelines, hopefully, to help us to become better people. And as we become better people in that way, we build a better world.